This is a story about a beetle. So I'd like to start with a flying beetle. I'm flying around more or less randomly looking for something that looks tree-like. Crash into that and then take a bite, see if it's a pine tree, see if it's something that they want to uh, enter and try and establish root in. If it passes that test, then they start chewing and tunneling their way into the tree. But hold on a second. I think we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves here. It starts with a beetle. Southern pine beetle is a predator of pine trees. It hunts and kills pine trees, something like wolves hunt and kill moose by operating in, in large packs. You may have heard of the mountain pine beetle is killing all the large full pine up and, uh, Western United States and Canada. This is a close relative, but it's found only in, in the south. Southern pine beetle is one of the few native pests that we have in the south. Basically what it is is a small beetle that is about the size of a grain of rice. When I used to talk to school kids about this, they would correct me and say it's about the size of a grain of uncooked rice. I mean, it's tiny. But when it gets together with a couple thousand of its best friends, it has the capability of killing a tree and then another tree and then hundreds and thousands of trees and, and thousands of acres, ultimately a huge outbreak. Millions or billions of dollars worth of damage. And it not only is economically devastating, but also can impact watershed habitat or wildlife habitat. And it all starts with one tree. And that first tree is often uh, attacked in the springtime, it's often a lightning strike. And the southern pine beetle calls in um, other southern pine beetle using pheromone communication. Pheromones by themselves aren't very attractive, but when they mix that pheromone odor with the odors of fresh resin, it draws in uh, thousands of beetles that not only fill up that tree, but when that tree is fully uh, colonized, and any uh, subsequent beetles go to the next nearest tree. And this is the moment when the battle between the southern pine beetle and the forest, or the southern pine beetle and a single tree, begins. Uh, the oleoresin that flows from a wound in the trunk of a pine tree, uh, the stuff that we make turpentine out of, is tremendously toxic. If I dropped you in a vat of this, you'd be dead within a few minutes. Uh, the beetles uh, uh, have the capacity to uh, detoxify this, and as remarkable as anything is their ability to swim through this incredibly viscous and sticky stuff. The beetles spend the first act of their siege on the tree working the resin tube, using their body and legs to shovel the resin out into the open air, always maintaining a tunnel to their habitat beneath the bark. mortal combat between the beetles and the trees, somebody's going to die. So you end up getting a domino effect, one tree after another, until you have a 10 or 20 or 30 tree infestation, and it develops very rapidly. And meanwhile, you may lose your whole uh, pine plantation. It was this kind of widespread devastation of timber plantations that first led us to notice the southern pine beetle. The earliest records of outbreaks stretch back to 1842, and since then foresters have struggled to understand and control this pest. In 1912, E.B. Mason stood before the North Carolina Forestry Association and said, I do not think it necessary for me to dwell on the seriousness of the situation in regard to the southern pine beetle. 
There is not a man here who has not seen the appalling amount of dead pine. Throughout the 20th century, foresters continued to urge control of this devastating pest. This task led them to investigate the world of their proclaimed enemy. Andrew Delmar Hopkins was chief among these early investigators. He understood the connection between basic biological understanding of an insect and its control. In 1902, speaking generally about the study of forest insects, he said, In this field very little is known compared with what there is yet to be learned. Especially is this true in regard to the life history, habits, and distribution of the injurious and beneficial species. Yet this knowledge is of the greatest importance in determining and applying methods of preventing losses. Hopkins had already started this endeavor in earnest for the southern pine beetle, and by the early 1900s could describe in surprising detail the habits of the beetle, having spent considerable time studying it and its characteristic S-shaped galleries. He identified predators, competitors, and other associated species, adding more and more actors to the story. A century later, the cast has grown immensely, and we are just beginning to understand the complexity of the world of the southern pine beetle. The beetles are not just a beetle, they're a community. There are 30 or 40 different species of mites that are associated with southern pine beetles. Uh, and riding with the beetles as they're flying through the forest looking, looking for a host tree. Uh, the beetles are themselves carrying their mutualistic fungi within highly specialized organs. So the mother beetle coming in, laying the eggs, at the same time inoculating the area around the eggs with these nutritionally rich fungi that the larvae can, can feed on. The fungi can grow out and fan out through the phloem and capture nitrogen and nutrients and concentrate them in this luxuriant growth of spores. And they can just sit there and eat the spores, if you will. Some of the mite species are carrying other fungi within their specialized structures. Uh, and it turns out that the fungi being carried by the mites is antagonistic with the fungi being carried by the beetles. Uh, and uh, for the beetle to survive, its fungi needs to become established. So what you really have is a little fungal battleground going on under the bark. When you look down within those mats of blue stain fungi, it's a jungle. Uh, you can see it teeming with hundreds of mites per square inch. Then, when the beetles uh, begin to pupate, uh, these mites pack their pouches with fungal spores, uh, find a beetle, climb into it, and ride with the beetle to the next tree. It's a cool ecosystem and, and southern pine beetle is kind of a, a keystone species in that insect community. Yeah, the southern pine beetle has been studied for a long time. One might say, well, aren't we done studying it yet? We've been looking at this thing for a hundred years. Don't we have it figured out yet? And the answer is, to a certain extent, yes, we know a lot about it, maybe as much as we think we're going to know to be able to control it. But the issue there becomes the conditions change all the time. We've got a changing climate in lots of senses of the word. Um, certainly temperatures are increasing. Precipitation can be down or more extreme. That alters the way in which we're able to deal with the beetle and deal with trees. If you look at the most recent outbreaks, they've all kind of occurred on the fringes of what we would consider to be Southern Pine Beetle Range, Southern Appalachians, New Jersey, and Northern Florida. And that's where our current story starts, in New Jersey. Not that New Jersey, or that New Jersey. This New Jersey. This is the Pinelands. So the Pinelands 
um, is the name for the one million acre area that takes up a large portion of southern New Jersey. Do you think of New Jersey as being just one big suburb between New York and Philadelphia, but in the middle of it you have this island of green in a sea of urbanization? It's the home to more than a hundred threatened and endangered species. For 50 million people, it's the forest that's in their neighborhood. Recent range expansion of the southern pine beetle in, in New Jersey is a, you know, a, a, a globally notable example of how uh, climatic change, anthropogenic climate warming of winter temperatures in particular in this case, can influence the distribution and abundance of organisms. The southern pine beetle in the New Jersey pine lands uh, most definitely has the potential to change the forest. Within 10 years, it's conceivable people driving through there are going to be asking themselves, why do they call it the pine lands? There is carbon stores that are held within those forests. There's biodiversity associated with these, these mature forests. And for people who value the things for whom old forests is their habitat, uh, uh, there's, there, there's reason to try and spare these when we can. So that would be the big question is, we know a lot about the southern pine beetle. We know what kind of damage it does. We've known, we know more and more as we study this, more and more about its biology and ecology, but what can we do about it? What's the, the who cares? How can we help to save the trees? So the number one way to control southern pine beetles is to not let them get going in the first place. And the number one way to do that is to thin them. You need to manage the forest, reduce the density. You don't want to have too many trees in your forest. They become stressed, they're less able to defend themselves from southern pine beetle. Your dominoes just stack up very close together and if you can thin those out, uh, removing every second or third tree, uh, it's good for forestry. The trees grow faster. If they start an infestation, it's less likely to, for that spot to expand. Um, so again, this is a native insect. This is not something that these trees are not used to dealing with. It's been a part of the system as long as they have. So keeping the trees healthy is a natural part of the life cycle of the southern pine beetle. And, uh, you know, I think if, if we were not here, if humans were not in the forest trying to build homes in it, and enjoy it, and live in it, and reap all of its benefits, which include water, and, and fire protection, and uh, wildlife, and aesthetics, and all those things, that if we weren't trying to reap all those benefits, sure, let the beetles have at it, because they're part of the natural system, and the pines have grown up right alongside them and they know how to deal with it. Sometimes the trees win, sometimes the bugs win. But because humans are here now, because we do have to control fire, because we do have homes in the forest, we can't just kind of let things go and assume that the southern pine beetle will play its natural role in the ecosystem as it used to, because the ecosystem isn't like it used to be. We have now, through our own intervention, stacked the deck against the trees being able to survive. We've put the trees in there so densely that we kind of need to step up and help them out. Prescribed fire may, may play a role because pine forests or pine ecosystems have always depended upon some low intensity fire. And so reintroducing low intensity fires can open up the stand and help maintain lower levels of competing vegetation. People have such emotional connections to trees, you know, and seeing trees die equates in a lot of people's minds to just destruction, you know, permanent death destruction of the forest. But that kind of qualification of the landscape being at its best when it's covered in trees is just a human construct, you know, who's to say that it's not best when a fire has just come through and there's herbaceous plants coming up. Without thinning, without prescribed burning, without allowing some of these stand replacing events to take place, we've ended up with very, very dense stands of pine, which creates what we commonly refer to as beetle bait. In the uh, 80s and 90s, uh, we established wilderness areas, uh, set them aside where no management would be done, and uh, 
Beatles essentially wiped them out within the 10 years. In terms of suppression or controlling Beatles once they're established, once an outbreak is occurring, number one thing is to cut out the trees that are affected immediately. And basically what you do in those situations are you go into an active spot, you cut currently infested trees and a buffer strip of green trees that are alive and not yet attacked. And it's hard to convince people sometimes to say, we need to sacrifice these trees, otherwise others are going to die. Um, because it's hard for them to understand, we need to be able to take down these trees. So it's a real issue. If you can, you remove those trees and get them out of the forest and hopefully get an economic return so it lessens the cost of suppression. But if you can't, you do cut and leave. And if it's hot enough, the sun will bake the beetles inside the trees and, and hopefully suppress that population from moving into additional trees. Most importantly, by cutting that buffer tree, you're eliminating any uh, fresh pine trees that the beetles can move into. And that's what the buffer does, uh, disconnect that, that line of dominoes. And it's a simple technique, but it's uh, been very successful. So the suppression efforts that took place last summer were surely uh, beneficial in terms of reducing the risk to the remaining pine lands. Uh, I think it's optimistic to think that the risks have been eliminated. It's a wildfire, a smokeless wildfire, we say, uh, and it's still, it's still burning. The suppression techniques used in New Jersey function by making the early life of the southern pine beetle difficult, tipping the balance in favor of the forest. Luckily, human efforts have help from natural parts of the system, which already make the life of the beetle a treacherous world. Remember our flying beetle from the beginning, who flew through the forest, landed on a tree, began to chew, and fought her way through the resin to lay eggs within the tree? Well, she was in the minority. Many larvae fail to get the nutrients they need to survive. Still others are eaten by the larvae of predators that squirm through the galleries, feasting on the immature beetles. Those who emerge and fly through the forest towards a host tree face even more obstacles. Spiderwebs hang between the pines, waiting for unwary flying insects like the beetles to trap themselves. And once on a host tree, the beetles are confronted by the fact that the same pheromones that drew them in will also attract predators, like the clarid beetle. As the southern pine beetle looks for a place to begin chewing into the tree, these predators lie in wait beneath shards of bark. While efforts have been made to raise and release predators to control the southern pine beetle, there has been little success. Instead, foresters have targeted another roadblock, the task every beetle taking off from its home tree must face, finding a suitable tree or ongoing infestation for colonization by following scents through the trees. We've done some studies simulating pheromone plumes, that if you release a tracer gas in a very dense stand, and you're simulating a pheromone plume here, it's more or less a sort of a snaking pheromone plume that goes through the forest. All the beetle has to do is kind of tack back and forth to keep on a track into that tree. If you do that same study in a thin stand, it's very chaotic. It jumps up and down. Um, large blobs of the tracer gas just go up into the atmosphere never to be seen again. So if you're a beetle trying to track that, you might get a hint of pheromone and then lose the track completely and not ever be able to find it again. So on the one hand, I'm totally enamored with this insect, love studying it, fascinated by the way it exists in this interface between completely healthy trees and dead trees. It has managed to make a living out of that little ephemeral habitat. But on the other hand, the devastation that it causes, I can use that same knowledge of all of those little aspects of its life cycle to say, what's the chink in the armor to stop it? What little step in there, what interaction can we take advantage of and exploit to stop it from causing the devastation that it causes? Without that biological knowledge, we don't have a chance of controlling this insect. Both a forester and an entomologist. And the forestry side of me understands that the forest resource is important to us as a society for a lot of different reasons and that forest area may be what you were going to use to pay for your kids' college, maybe what you're going to retire on. 
it's harvesting your stand basically before you intended to do so. And it also has ecological impacts. On the other side of things, it's one of the coolest insect communities that you can think about. The, the fungal component and the bacteria and the mites and the parasitoids and the, the predators. I'm particularly impressed by the amount of broadly relevant knowledge and understanding that's grown as a result of this. It's inspiring, actually, that the knowledge matters. It's very freeing to know that much about an insect. Some of the work we're doing recently, looking at the role of bacteria in the life cycle of the southern pine beetle. These are bacteria that produce novel antibiotic compounds we didn't even know existed. We've been able to really make discoveries that help people up understand other bark beetles, understand other invasive insects, understand symbiosis in general, and now we've got new techniques, new partners, new opportunities to find out more. And that's where our story ends, with this wealth of basic biology knowledge, the unexpected and perhaps unintended offshoot of a cycle of devastation, research, and control. It all started with a beetle, with a tree, with a forest, with a decimated lumber yard in 1842, and a microscope a century later. But it all ends with an understanding of the world of a tiny beetle.